Good morning. Uh, Cheryl just reminded me that many people are on the brink of losing Medicaid, and she's going to be working with the tribe some just to provide some alternatives for those who have fallen into the gap, but it gives us something else to pray for. Uh, there are millions of people who will be lo losing uh, Medicaid, so uh, some in our tribe may. So we need to provide alternatives. That's another thing that we need to do as Christian people. So Cheryl, thank you, and I will be in touch. So our call to worship this morning is that your name. We say Yahweh, Yahweh, and the Hebrews, the Jewish folks say Yahweh. So let's stand and be part of this call to worship, and let's feel it as it is des described, a call to worship. Amen. It's time to shout his name because there are lots of shouts out there that don't relate at all to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. At this time, I'm going to ask Miss Laura if she'll come and bring our inv invitation. Invocation. Hopefully, which will lead to people accepting Christ. Morning. Um, before I open us in prayer, um, there's been a scripture that's been stuck on my mind lately, and so I wanted to share that with y'all, that's okay. It's Psalms, Psalm 62, verse 1, and it says, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. All right, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the time that we're able to gather together. Father God, I ask that we will truly find rest in your salvation today. I ask that you will help us throw down all of our cares, all of our anxieties, everything that's clouding our mind and our mental space, Father God. I ask that you will clear it so that we can receive the word that you want us to receive today. We thank you, and we love you, and we praise your name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I will. Uh, at this time, I'm, I will bring greetings from a church. My name is Stephen Adkins. I'm a deacon here at Samaria Baptist Church. I would uh, bring greetings and welcome to all of you who are here in this building, to those who may be in the parking lot, to those who may be watching on Facebook or, or later in the week on YouTube. I want you to know that today there's a lot of anxiety in the world and people need to feel like they belong. And I remember as a kid people would say, what what church do you belong to? People don't say that much anymore, and I said some area of Baptist church. But in a real sense, if you're here today, you belong here. Belonging has lots of different connotations, but where I'm going with it is you belong in this space at this time, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or in the parking lot, God has called you here for, for a purpose. And that purpose is to learn more about him, to worship him, and to equip yourself to go out and help ease that anxiety that's in the world by giving folks a sense of belonging. Amen. Folks, I belong here. I belong to the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So any church that worships in the name of the risen Lord, you belong. We are his feet, his hands. We are here, and there's a distinct place for you here in the Lord's house. You all have a discreet service that you can perform. Let's do it. And let's tell the world we belong here. But beyond that, tell the fallen world you belong here too. So that's going to be part of our, it is part of our mission. And let's take it, let's take it very seriously. So again, I welcome you today. If you're a guest, you won't be a guest long. You feel like you belong, and I know you'll come back and worship with us. At this time, Sister Laura will lead children's church, and all of us will learn from it. Morning. Y'all doing okay? You gonna stand up here with me? Okay. 
All right. Did everybody have a good week in school? Because we're missing some. Milan, are you coming? You want to come? You can, can, LaVon, can you move those streamers out the way for him? He's right here. All right, so did y'all have good weeks? Y'all did? Good. Yeah? You did? Ooh, that's exciting. I bet you had fun. Yeah, we can go one day. Yeah, <laughs> we can do that. All right, so I had like a, an object lesson planned, but something happened during the week, and I felt like God wanted me to do something different, so I'm going to listen and obey God in what I feel like he wants me to talk about. So, now this person, I can't say the person's name, because I was given strict orders not to, but one morning early, somebody in my house woke up, they had a really bad dream, and they were very fearful and they got in bed with me, and I was already up reading my Bible, and so we prayed. And then, because I find comfort when I'm stressed in reading the Bible, and so I asked, I said, now that we've prayed, since I'm reading my Bible, do you want me to get your Bible so that you can look through your Bible while I'll do my study? And they said, no, ma'am, but you can read me a Bible story. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So the first Bible story that I thought about was Daniel in the lion's den. So we're going to talk about that. Um, who knows the story of Daniel in the lion's den? Me do? A couple of y'all do? Good. You know it? Great. You know a little bit? What's the part that y'all know? Yeah, it's pretty, yep, yeah, they put Daniel in the cave with some lions. All right, but we're going to talk about that. And I left my notes at my seat, but that's okay. All right, so a little backstory. Do you want to go sit down or are you okay up there? All right, so there was a king called King Darius, and he ruled the land, okay? He ruled over a big chunk of land. He had to rule over a lot of people. And he selected 120 people to help him govern the different areas in the land. And out of those 120 people, he selected three people to help him oversee all of that. So he had things in place to help everything go smoothly. And out of those three people was Daniel. Now, King Darius in that land, they did not worship our God. They had different gods, but Daniel was faithful to God, okay? And God rewarded him through his obedience and his faithfulness. And um, some of the people, they didn't like it. They kind of, the other leaders got jealous because the king was actually, he found good favor with Daniel, and he was going to actually help lead even more. And so they didn't like that, and so they devised a plan, and they tricked the king into saying that nobody could pray to any other god but the king for 30 days. Could you imagine living in a place where you had to be under that rule? Nope, nope me either. But guess who stayed faithful and still prayed to God? Can y'all guess who? Daniel. Daniel, good job. So... The other leaders, Daniel went to go pray anyway, and it says that he thanked God, and he gave thanks to God, and he also asked God for help. But during that time, they caught him praying, so they told the king, 
and the king tried because he actually really liked Daniel. It says that he tried everything up into sundown to save Daniel, but the decree had to stay in place. And so Daniel, they had to throw him into the lion's den. In Daniel chapter 6, it says, King Darius spoke to Daniel and say, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. So they put him in the lion's den. Who would be so scared of that? That sounds like a scary thing. <clears throat> and it says that night in the chapter 6 of Daniel that the king, he had no rest. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat. And as soon as morning came, he went out to where Daniel was. And he says, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions, and they have not hurt me, because I have found innocent in his sight, nor have I done anything wrong before your majesty. So then the king issued a new decree, and he said that every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of lions. So that was a really scary thing that Daniel had to go through. But did God rescue and save him? Yeah, so I know we go through things that are scary. Um, who's got SOL tests coming up? Who's back there? Who's kind of nervous about the SOL tests? A couple of y'all are. That's okay. So things like tests, um, maybe some bad storms, maybe you have bad dreams. Things in life will happen, and it could cause you to be fearful. But I want y'all to remember that he that God rescues and saves. Can y'all repeat after me? Say, God rescues and God saves. So if we put our trust and our faith in Jesus, things might not end up how we thought they will, will but God will always help you, and he will always make a way for you, okay? All right. Now, does anybody have any prayer requests? You do, or do you just want to pray? What's your prayer request? Do you want to? God, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everyone came to church, and I hope, and I hope you have a good day at, at church again. And, and I hope we praise about you, God. And and I hope we have a good day. And and I hope we have a good month. And and I hope we have, I hope we go in the I hope you can learn about you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now y'all get to go to children's church with, with oh, I'm coming with y'all. Okay, great. And we continue to thank Laura and Robin and others who contribute so much to uh, Children's Church. Let's turn our attention now to the prayers of the church and uh, Deacon David Adkins will lift up those prayers. As I read off the list, I'll ask you to be in prayer for these individuals and then uh, we'll collectively pray. Earl Herndon. Marion Herndon, Ron Begman, Zelma Wynn, Bernetta Thunderhawk, Cannonball and Little Eagle Communities, Laura Key, Elwyn Smith, The Unsaved, Wayne Phillips, There's Shingles in the Eye, 
Doug Leach, he injured his infected hand. Pastor Jeff Johnson uh, really needs our prayers to lift him up. Doug Brown, who has lung problems. Baby Aspen Smith, I admitted in the hospital. Uh, so family friend of Brittany Johnson. Families that are grieving. Becky Armstrong. Praise report that Leslie is doing well after a trip to the ER. Uh, Sabrina Smith, you, she's with New Vine Baptist Church. Cancer patients. Uh, praise report, thanking God for answered prayers. Michael McEwen, Dolly Atkins, and praise God for uh, another granddaughter. Father God, we just thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Father, we thank you for your promises and knowing that uh, you love us beyond measure. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to be your children when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. So as we lift up these prayer concerns, these praise reports, uh, we know that you hear us. We know that you love us. We know, Jesus, that uh, as you're sitting at the right hand of the Father, that you intercede on our behalf. Uh, we thank you so much for the privilege of coming to you, our creator, our provider. So, God, we just can help us to walk in faith. Be with us on that journey as you provide answers. Help us to have open hearts to receive the answer that you present before us. Help us not to dictate to you what you should do, but to hear your voice as you lead and guide us as to what you are going to do. So, Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we have the praise song, a couple of things I'd like to share with you. If you recall, many of you, when we purchased the land that the worship center sits on, we embarked upon a very, very aggressive uh, building program to convert Old Samaria School into part of this worship space. It, it was a daunting task, but, but we believed that God was going to prepare a way, and he did. And we have lots of space here that goes largely unused during the week. And I think part of God answering our prayers is that we utilize this to, in one sense, reach Charles City for Christ, but, but to share with the world, prepare people to go into the world. Uh, when Wayne and I, first assistant chief, were, were trying to gain federal recognition, and people were dropping off, said, you're crazy, it's not going to happen, and we, we continued to, to pursue it. We were successful, and the tribe is growing. Uh, our mission is expanding. Several years ago, uh, Wayne led an effort. We worked to gain, to gain funds for the child care development program, and we were, we were successful, and, and there were lots of peaks and valleys, and sometimes we wanted to give up because the things that they were requiring us to do just didn't seem to fit. So we have that now, and it's working. And we uh, funded a facility in New Kent, just signed the purchase order to put six to $4,000 worth of equipment on that property for their child care. Some time ago, Samaria was given an opportunity to participate and child care and maybe use these facilities and for whatever reason we chose to pivot. And perhaps some of the reason is what if? Why? Uh, typically I'm why not, but I go in where wise men fear to tread. But the point that I'm making today is we are in a position where we can really do God's kingdom work here. If you recall, when Esther, when Mordecai spoke to Esther, he said, God's put you here in this place for such a time as this. Elijah, who had seen a lot of successes, he decided to flee from Jezebel because he was afraid God wouldn't finish what he started. If God starts it, he's going to finish it. 
Noah was building the ark. Those folks had never seen rain. 120 years, said, you're crazy. He persevered. Moses, when he was given a challenge, he said, I don't know, I don't speak well. I can't do this. God provided a way. When God called out to Samuel, Samuel didn't recognize who's calling, and it's significant to note that he was brought up in the church. So people in the church today may not know when God is calling. We've got to help them so that when God calls, they can do like Samuel and say, here am I, Lord. Here I am. So why am I saying all of this? When God spoke to Cordy, said we want worship on wheels, he may not have articulated it, articulated that way. Cordy was somewhat intimidated, but she thought about it. And I'm sure she said, what, suppose this happens. But she began that and the church has rallied around her and it's working. So what I'm throwing out to you is we have to find a way to use these resources God has entrusted us with because they do in fact still belong to him. We've got to use, figure a way to use these facilities to help spread God's kingdom work here on earth. And I know the tribe is going to be giving opportunities to the church in some instances that we can help fund. But I think we'll open the door to the larger community to the message of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, which is so sorely needed today. So what I'm asking you as a church, you know, we need, I tell people I'm old and bold. <laughs> what we need to do is, is, is go to our leadership, and I'm part of church leadership, and, and challenge, challenge us to do what God has called us to do. And the same vote that put us in office can take us out. So you have choices. We're at a pivotal stage in both the history of, the, of Samaria Church and in God's kingdom work. So I challenge you to help us find our place to expand our offerings to, world, to a world that needs to hear about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. I know through Christ all things are possible. The scripture says the effectual fervent prayer of righteous people availeth much. So folks, let's, let's get there. Let, let's put our shoulders to the wheel and even our nose to the grindstone if necessary to help affect God's kingdom and work here on earth. Now let us... Uh, Join in this praise song, Heaven Came Down. to God's family. 
One thing I forgot to add, we do have people who are equipping themselves to, to serve in the capacity I described. We have one uh, who has completed coursework for a bachelor's, either a master's in Christian education. Laura Laura's begin course, will begin coursework. We have uh, a member of the church who has a master's in early childhood education. Uh, so we have some of the tools we need to move forward. Uh, I pray that God will lead us and we will, we will follow his leadership, wherever that will take us. There will be some times that uh, we wonder how we're going to get through it, but I'm sure when Joshua was <laughs> making that seventh trip around Jericho, <laughs> he, he probably still had a few doubts. But God is faithful. God wants the best for us. And, and don't forget it. Father, I ask you to speak to our pastor today, the shepherd of this flock. Give him the words he needs, Father, and conviction to bring that message forth. I thank you for the pastor. I thank you for Miss Kathy. I thank you for Samaria Church. I thank you for churches all over the world who have at the helm our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In your son's perfect, powerful name, we pray. Amen. Amen. And I'll tell you, Samaria Church grows as excitement around here builds up. It's going to attract people. Right. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you. So glad you're here today. Oh, praise God. He is good. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for coming out today. Uh, I want you to open your Bibles or look up here on the screen or look on your devices, however you need to do it, and uh, turn to John's Gospel, Chapter 6. It's a kind of a lengthy uh, uh, scripture today, but that's okay. We'll get through it. And, uh, and let's stand as we sing, if you are able. I mean, not as we sing, but as we read God's word together, okay? All right. John 6, beginning at verse 26. Uh, well, I'm going to, yeah. 
I'm going to back up to 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they ask him, and this is our title, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they ask him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will, we, what will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it's, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. And then, if you would, skip down to verse 47. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the men in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. <clears throat> How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Our Heavenly Father, we look to you in faith uh, through your Son, Jesus, to, um, to be partakers of this bread and, uh, and to spread and to share it with the world all around us. I want to thank you, Lord, for the words that uh, Brother Steve brought this morning and uh, his, his encouragement for us to be about the business of reaching uh, the county and beyond for, for your kingdom. And Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would fill us to overflowing, each and every one of us to do exactly that. We love you. Speak to our hearts at this time, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. In the incarnation, we know that Jesus came down from heaven, and he was born of a virgin in the town of Bethlehem. And Bethlehem means house of bread. And out of the house of bread comes the bread of life. For every good and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow uh, of turning. Leading up to our text, the day before, Jesus had fed more than 5,000 men. In that day and time, women and children were not counted, which means when you include the women and children, that crowd swelled to anywhere from, from 12 to 15,000 people or more. 
which, which makes the miracle even, even greater than what we originally thought. And after that, Jesus withdrew himself to a mountain to pray, and the disciples, they got into their boat and began making their way to Capernaum. Uh, <clears throat> but as they rode, and it got dark, a storm came upon them, and they were terrified. Suddenly, uh, Suddenly, in the midst of the storm, Jesus comes to them walking on the water, saying, It is I, don't be afraid. And as soon as he climbed into the boat, immediately the boat reached the shore. The next day, the multitudes got in their boats to look for Jesus because, because they knew, uh, well, <laughs> They didn't know where he was, and, and they wanted to find him. Uh, and, and when they did find him, they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? They knew Jesus uh, hadn't left with the disciples. And so they didn't understand. But Jesus ignores their question, and he tells them their motive for seeking him out was an unworthy one. In essence, Jesus tells them there are two kinds of food, food for the body, which is necessary, but not the most important. Then there is a food for the inner person of the spirit, which is essential. What every person ultimately needs is, is not food, but life. And life is a gift. Food only sustains earthly life. And one day, all of us, if the Lord doesn't come first, will grow weary of eating food. It's true. I've stood at the bedside of many people in the process of, uh, of dying, and you want, to, you want to give them something to eat to, uh, to strengthen them. But they're having nothing of it. Jesus gives the bread that sustains for eternal life, and he invites all to taste and see that the Lord is good. So the crowd asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? What must we do to do the works God requires? It's a good question, don't you think? I mean... <clears throat> If we're really serious about uh, our commitment uh, to Christ, it's probably a question that we've asked our ourselves because we want to be pleasing to God. But like the crowd, when we ask the question, we don't realize it's the wrong question. Jesus corrects their question and ours about the works of God, plural, with the singular work of God. In Luke's gospel, <clears throat> he tells the story of Martha, the sister of, of Mary and Lazarus. Well, Martha was pretty upset because her sister, Mary, was sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening uh, to him and not helping Martha in the kitchen. And upset as she was, she, she puts her hands on her hips and she says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me here doing the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, basically, Jesus is saying the same thing here in our text. What's the one thing? Faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Belief in the one that God has sent. That's the work that God requires. The only work that God requires. Nothing complicated about it. Nothing hard about it. 
Anyone can do it. And that's the way God designed it because it's not his will that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God created you. God created me because he loves us unconditionally and he wants us to spend eternity with him in heaven. Yet like the crowd... Most people seem to think, well, you know, I've got to to work my way to heaven. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Ephesus, um, tells us you are saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Coming to God is a work of grace that can never be earned, only received. Turn in your Bibles uh, or look up here on the screen to verse 30 with me. Verse 30, I just want you to see it again if you would. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Now, more than likely, these people had seen at least several miracles uh, that Jesus had wrought besides the feeding uh, of the multitude. So this wasn't their first rodeo. In fact, that's why most of them uh, were there, because they had seen Jesus do one miracle, and they wanted to see him uh, do, uh, do some more. When we put our faith in Christ, it's never about what we do. It's always about what he has already done. The crowd sought out Jesus because the day before he had fed them. Now they were looking for him to do something even, even greater, a greater miracle. At that time, rabbis taught that when the Messiah comes, he would duplicate the miracle of manna, how how God fed the children of Israel in the wilderness. If Jesus was the Messiah, let him prove it. They were saying, if we see it, we'll believe it. Do you remember when Jesus was suffering and dying on the cross. Do you remember what what the crowd said? They said, if he comes down from the cross, if we see that, then we'll believe. But that's not faith, is it? Oftentimes we too say seeing is believing, but that puts the focus That puts the focus on sight, not faith. Faith is trusting God at his word, and we either do or we don't. Our eyes can play tricks on us, can't they? You ever heard of a mirage? (laughs) Well, that's your mind and your eyes giving you trouble. What about our feelings? Are they ever wrong? Sometimes, sometimes God will show us a sign. Sometimes he'll, he'll, he'll give us a feeling, but all of the time he expects us to trust him at his word. Uh, we are not to be a people of sight. We're not to be a people of feelings. We have been called to be a people of faith. Whenever we insist upon seeing a sign, we're not acting in faith at all. Sight does not save. Feelings do not save. Faith in Christ always will. How did the writer of Hebrews say it? Faith is the confidence and what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Can I get an amen? Amen. Jesus quickly but lovingly corrects the crowd, saying, It wasn't Moses 
who gave your ancestors manna? It was God. Take your focus off of Moses, who cannot save, and put it where it belongs, on the God who loves you, who, who gives you the true bread of life and can save to the uttermost. In the past, God had given the people manna, but now he offers the true bread from heaven, and Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I have come not just for Israel, but for the whole world. I have come not just to sustain earthly life, but to give life in all of its fullness. Jesus didn't come into this world to give out manna or to fulfill any other materialistic expectation. Jesus answers their question about what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you. He gives them the answer, but it's not the answer they want. It's not the answer they were expecting. And Jesus says, I am. The same I am who said to Moses, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of, uh, of Jacob. I am the God who said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. I am the one who told Moses when he asked, what is your name? I am who I am. And just in case you still don't understand, when Jesus says, I am, he is saying, I am God. And I'm pretty certain, I'm pretty certain that the people who heard him understood that, and I imagine they didn't care for it all that much, but they didn't really believe him either. And by and large, that's true for many of us today, don't you think? I mean, come on. If we really, really believed with all our heart that Jesus is God, wouldn't we take him a little more seriously when it comes to obeying his word? Uh, wouldn't we be a little bit more adamant about sharing our faith with others? Wouldn't we be a little quicker to deny ourselves take up our cross daily and follow him? Uh, wouldn't we be a, a little less judgmental in our dealings with one another? Wouldn't we show a little more forgiveness, a little more kindness, a little more mercy, a little more grace, a little more love to each other? Wouldn't we be more apt to rejoice every day, remembering this is a day that the Lord has made? And I suppose I could go on, but I think you get the point. Many of us, like the multitude before Jesus, we believe in God. We just don't believe him. But his word is always true. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Through the prophet Isaiah, God says, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God will stand forever. Even at one point, Jesus asked his disciples, why call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? In verse 47 of our text, when Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. He's saying your eternal life doesn't start the moment you die, but the moment you put your faith in him. Jesus' main concern then, Jesus' main concern now, and Jesus' main concern 5,000 years from now, if, if the world's still even here. is for the eternal souls of people because God so loved 
the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, listen to this, should not perish but have everlasting life. If we truly... Uh, if we have truly been, uh, have passed from death to life, if we have truly been born again, if Jesus is truly our Lord and Savior, shouldn't that be our greatest concern too? Amen? You know what, folks, and I don't say this to make you think that I'm sort of some sort of glorious saint. Y'all know better. I'm a sinner like everybody else. <sighs> But in all seriousness, I'm not concerned at all about whether or not I'll go to heaven when I die. I'm not concerned about it. I know I'm going to heaven when I die because I have God's word on it, and I believe God's word. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, I've done that. I've done that, and I know some of you have as well. What concerns me, what concerns me is, is all of the times that I've known what God wants me to do, and I've insisted upon having my way over his. What concerns me is is all the times I knew the Spirit was moving me to, uh, to reach out and make disciples, and I didn't do it. Uh, what concerns me is, is when I knew to be obedient and, and, and active, when, when I clearly understood Jesus when he said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was, I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. What concerns me is the times I knew I should have been busy doing some of those things. And I wasn't. What concerns me is when I get to heaven, will he say, Oh, yeah, it's you. Come on in. Or will he say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Did I believe Jesus is the bread of life enough to fully partake of him so that others knew that Jesus is my food? That Jesus is my drink. That Jesus is my substance. That Jesus is my life. Did I believe like that? Do you? A lot of people claim to be Christians in this nation. But personally, I'm not seeing much evidence of it. I am seeing more and more people living in fear, living in confusion. But God is not the author of confusion. Satan is. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What I'm seeing is, is more and more people living with anger and hatred and, and, and bitterness and, and, and jealousy and unforgiveness. Uh, we see mass shootings, senseless killings in this nation every day. Every day. And most of it is due to not only people who have not partaken of the bread of life, 
but many who claim that they have but never show any evidence of it, never bear any fruit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And what we're living through is the last uh, couple of generations leaving Christ out of their lives, leaving Christ out of their marriages, leaving Christ out of their families, leaving Christ out of their businesses, leaving Christ out of their schools. And what we're seeing is life without Christ produces a hell on earth. I'm not seeing people line up to get saved. I'm not seeing people uh, line up to come to church, to be baptized, to be prayed over, to read and study and learn God's word. I'm not seeing people line up to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and do you know why that is? It's because, by and large, God's people have stopped telling others where they can find the bread of life. It was D.T. Niles, the evangelist from India, who coined the phrase, evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. And as God's church in the 21st century, that's what we've got to get back to. By pointing people to the bread of life. But, but they need to hear it in our words and they need to see it in our lives. In the book of Acts, we're told what the people of that day were saying about the early followers of Jesus. They were saying this, these Christians are turning our world upside down for Jesus. No one's saying that about us, are they? Did you ever ask yourself why? Well, by and large, it's because they're not seeing it lived out. And they're not hearing it being told. And sadly, too many so-called believers don't fully believe it themselves. <laughs> and if you don't fully believe it yourself, why would anybody in your sphere of influence ever believe it either? Some of the Jews were asking, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were thinking about cannibalism, but Jesus is talking about the work that God requires of us. It was Jesus' way of saying we are to take his words, his, his very life, his death, his, his burial, his, his resurrection. We are to take it into our being. It's what Paul was referring to when he wrote, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus is talking about, and Paul is talking about, abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will bear much fruit but apart from me, you can do nothing. The Son has no life apart from the Father, and you and I have no life apart from Christ. Finally, Jesus reminds the crowd, as wonderful as the manna uh, was for the children of Israel, there had been no life-giving quality in it. For all the people who ate of the manna, all of them died just like everybody else. But those who partake of Christ, the bread of life, will never die. Now, of course, we all know that one day, unless the Lord comes first, that we will all physically die. But spiritually, we will live eternally by partaking of the bread of life and and you have God's word on it. Amen? Trusting Christ 
believing in him who came down from heaven. That's the work. That's the only work that God requires. And you know what? That's something all of us can do. Simply put, if you will believe in the bread of life who comes down from heaven through, through his word and through a prayer, he will change your life. When we open up our hearts, he opens up our eyes. And when we do that, something, something wonderful, something wonderful can happen that's, that's so beautiful. Uh, something Myra Brooks Welsh put like this. It was battered and scarred and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar? A dollar? Now two? Only two? Two dollars. And who will make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow, then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as an angel sings. The music ceased and the auctioneer with a voice that was quiet and low said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, and who will make it two? Two thousand dollars, and who will make it three? Three thousand once, and three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried. We do not quite understand. What changed its worth? The man replied, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with a life out of tune and battered and torn with sin is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin, a mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a, a game, and he'll travel on. He's going once and going twice. He's going and almost gone, but the master comes and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Has he touched you? If he has, what are you waiting for? Surrender your life in faith to Christ if you've never done so before. And let him, let him make beautiful music of your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending down the bread of life for us to partake of and, and be a part of. Help us to live in your spirit and to, and to be sure to let others know about it. I don't know how this message lands with people here today, Lord, but, but I believe it's landing with some. And I pray, Father, that you would just use it to bring glory and honor to your holy name. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll sing our hymn of invitation. I'll ask my deacons to step out. And uh, if God is speaking to you and you just need to pray or maybe you, maybe you need to give your life and faith to Christ, I don't know what your decisions are, but God does. And he loves you and he'll move in your life and work with you. You just need to trust him. So if God is speaking to you today, uh, you come. I'll be standing here as well. So let's stand as we sing our hymn of invitation. Two verses. 
this last one come we'll sing more